Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Paul. I should also acknowledge um, our past national president, Kos Glavos, as well. Thank you, sir, for your ongoing support. And we've also got another national president here, Flynn. Where's Flynn? There he is down the back, the national president of, um, of NAPSA. And it just seems like yesterday that I did that, but it was nearly 20 years ago that I did that job. So for people that remember me doing it, that was nearly two decades ago. So welcome, Flynn, and to um, the members of your board as well. Um, listen, I want to start by um, thanking each and every one of you. And um, I want to reiterate what Paul and Michelle said for the immense work that you have all done and your staff have all done over the past 24 months. And I just want you to cast your minds back to March at the beginning of the pandemic, before we had the safety net that was JobKeeper, the financial safety net that so many households and families relied on, and before we had the clinical safety net that was uh, the COVID-19 vaccine that protected us and our families also. And it was pretty scary early on. A lot of people were being stood down. A lot of companies went into hibernation as National Cabinet and or COAG as it was then were trying to figure out how they were going to handle um, the closing down of the Australian economy. And the majority of our workforce, whether it's the 35,000 pharmacists or the 65,000 pharmacy assistants, most of our workforce are female and under the age of 40. And during those very early weeks of the pandemic, more often than not, they were the only financial breadwinner of their households as other people went without pay for a few weeks before their employers figured out what they were doing. And most of those individuals were indeed caring up uh, for parents or grandparents and caring down for children as well. And so I just wanted to start by saying thank you for rocking up when many other aspects of Australia's primary healthcare system hid behind telehealth around their kitchen benches. Um, you all showed up and saw people when many others did not. So um, just the Pharmacy Guild of Australia and, and PDL and the college just want to say thank you for all doing that. Now, there are three key documents. These are all publicly available. And tonight we're going to talk about not just the 24 months that has been, but of course we're going to talk about the 24 months that is yet to come and beyond. But in order for us to articulate where we are going and what success looks like, we need to look at it through three different prisms. Now, all of these three books, um, which if you haven't read and, you know, S3 Melatonin isn't doing it for you, then I'd strongly suggest you get a copy of these. The white one on this side of the screen is about the practitioner, the pharmacist. And what we did in combination with the World Pharmacy Council is that we did an environmental scan of the 38 countries that comprise the OECD, or the Organisation of Economic Cooperation and Development. And unfortunately, pharmacists in Australia ranked 37 out of 38. So we were the second most boring place in the world to be a pharmacist, right? The Kiwis across the ditch, of course, have the wooden spoon. But uh, there must be at least one Kiwi in the audience that always is. Um, but we're going to do something about it, right? So what this document does is it articulates what a full scope of practice community pharmacist is in the Australian context. And other professions, um, quite frankly, with a large degree of hubris and of course a small degree of arrogance would like to think that we are defining our future relative to what they're doing. And of course nothing could be further from the truth, right? A profession is responsible, right? for defining what is success for it and what its future should look like. And that's exactly what this document does for a practitioner, for a pharmacist. And it does it by benchmarking the practice of its profession to its peers around the world. That's what full scope of practice is, right? It's not trying to do tasks that currently are being carried out by another practitioner in another profession in Australia. That is the furthest thing from the truth. It's about being medication experts but it's about being able to do all things for all people with all medicines. And I will talk about it in some more detail in a moment. The one in the middle, the blue book, is about the practice. To be able to deliver a safe, clinical, accessible service in Australia, um, it's not just about having the skills and knowledge to perform a wider array of tasks. It's about having all of the scaffolding and support around you that you need. And that's not just having appropriately a trained support staff, and we'll talk about pharmacy assistance later as well. But it's about the physical environment. And of course, the most obvious manifestation of that is having um, a consulting room. But it's about all of the things 
that our IT companies are doing. And our PDL chairman also leads Australia with his other hat in that respect as well. It's about making sure that pharmacy is no longer an island, it's integrated with the rest of the primary and tertiary healthcare system, whether it be through things like the My Health Record, whether it be through things like electronic prescriptions, or of course, in the great state of Queensland, which is leading the way by having access to things like the viewer. So if a patient presents to a community pharmacy in Queensland, we can access all of their clinical records for things that have been done to them and things that they have received through Queensland health facilities. So the last document, the green document, is about your guild. It's your guild, COS and, and I and, and the rest and Amanda. We're just custodians and looking, at after, looking after it for you for whatever short or long period of time that you wish us to do that. But your guild exists for going on 100 years now, aren't we, Suzanne, in 2027, to enable the first two things. It doesn't exist for creating wealth for wealth's sake. It exists because it has profit and profit for purpose, to be able to invest in all of the things that we're going to be able to talk about tonight with, of course, our partners at PDL and the college. I'm not going to go through all of these things. These are the things that you know all too well that have dominated our profession and our practices over the course of the last 24 months. But I do want to call out two very important successes that we have had together. And the first one is vaccinations. So it may seem like a long time ago to Flynn that 2014 was the first time a pharmacist in the great state of Queensland put a needle in someone's arm, wasn't it, cause to deliver the first pharmacist administered influenza vaccine. But to fast forward only eight years, we haven't had it for a decade yet, and to think from April this year to where we stand here today, so just from April until September, the majority of COVID-19 vaccines in the Commonwealth of Australia have been administered by community pharmacy. You can add up state and territory run vaccination clinics, general practice, community controlled health organisations, you can add all of those together and we've all given more. We've given more because patients have had the choice, but they've voted with their feet and they've chosen all of you. They've chosen you because they trust you. They've chosen you because all other things being equal, you're more accessible, you're even more trusted, if not just as trusted, to be able to deliver services. And that is really the biggest win that we've had in full scope of practice in recent times. And that win, I have no doubt, will be able to roll out to all of the other vaccines to help us provide solutions to vaccine preventable diseases, but to other areas, whether it be in acute occasions of service or chronic disease management, which we'll talk about a bit in a moment as well. The other one is for rapid antigen tests. Now, I received a phone call for the Prime Minister in the second week of January, saying, Trent, can you use that pseudoephedrine thing, the one that COS started? And I should say, um, a lot of the things that the Guild is able to capitalise on now is, is because of the forethought and leadership that people before me have done. And if COS hadn't started Project Stop, we would not have had the rapid antigen test program that we had this year. So, sir, I know everyone is very grateful for that program, but really, if you hadn't done that, um, we wouldn't have had it, so thank you very much. But I received a, score, a, a phone call from Morrison saying, Trent, I'm about to stand up to tell the country that they can receive free rapid antigen tests from all the pharmacies. Can I say that I've spoken to you? I said, Prime Minister, of course you can. He hung up and, and the health minister called straight away and said, Trent, I hear you're going to do it for $10 a test. I said, absolutely, plus GST, plus an AHI. And then he called me all sorts of one syllable, four letter words, and I think this is being recorded tonight, so that's wonderful. Um, uh, but, and, and after about five days, he agreed, and the program was rolled out. But listen, it wasn't as simple as that. Uh, the third phone call I had wasn't to the National Council to tell them about the blank check that I'd just written. It was to Paul to find out whether or not it was even technically possible. Um, he was on leave, and he was good enough to give us some technologist um, from Fred IT to assist Guildlink to be able to um, help make the amendments that were required to that. So thanks very much for that. But listen, the, the real benefit of that program was 7 million of the poorest, the oldest, the most frail, and the most vulnerable in our community were able to access, for the first time in the history of our country and our profession in this country, access free point of care testing for an infectious disease. In fact, over 70 million tests over that period of time were provided to 7 million people. And that has never existed before. And so um, I just want to thank all of our pharmacy assistants, because whilst the pharmacists were busy inoculating people against the virus, it by and large was a pharmacy assistant run program. Um, so thank you to all of the PAs that were in the room. I love figures. 
right? Because um, talk is cheap and um, there's a lot of people that talk really loud in our profession and they've got absolutely no detail to back it up. But this is the federal budget. And listen, we have two federal budgets this year. We had the one by the Tories in April and we've got by the one by the Socialists next month. And pollies say a lot of things, but it's not until you actually see how they want to spend your money that you actually find out what they believe in. Um, this is an excerpt from the April budget from the Morrison government, and this is spending on the pharmaceutical benefit scheme for this financial year and each year of the forwards, so three years. What do you notice about this graph? It's dead set flat. There's no investment in the pharmaceutical benefit scheme. Now, the last parliament of Australia, I don't say the government, the last parliament of Australia presided over more new listings and amended listings, over 2,000 in fact, than any parliament before it. Um, and every Sunday we became accustomed to the previous health minister standing up from a drug no one could pronounce for a disease no one heard of. And I am not belittling a rare disease program. If one of my children had a rare disease, it would be exceptionally important to my wife and I that we were able to access a treatment to be able to look after one of my children. And we're a very wealthy country and we should be having a world-leading uh, world rare disease program. But all of those new listings were not because of new investment. All of those new listings were completely funded by cuts to chronic disease management. And you hear a lot of talk from politicians about investing in chronic disease management. But when it comes to pharmacy, when it comes to the pharmaceutical benefit scheme, their rhetoric falls short. Their promises ring hollow. Because all they've done is cut and cut and cut the low cost, high volume medicines that we all use to be able to treat chronic disease in Australia. Now, there couldn't be a larger contrast than spending on the rest of the health budget. $34 billion more in health spending for just three areas. Um, I've, got, I've left my glasses. Uh, Medicare, hospitals, and aged care, $34 billion more. Now, do you really think more money for an inefficient hospital system is gonna solve ramping? More money for an in inefficient MBS system is going to solve and reduce GP waiting times or increase bulk billing rates. More money to institutionalise people into aged care facilities instead of helping them age where they want to, which is at home. So a complete flat PBS over every year of the forwards and a ballooning $34 billion, an eye-watering $34 billion more in each of those areas. But this is where community pharmacy can help. We're not asking for access to those funds, we're asking for state and territory governments to remove the regulatory barriers that prevent Queenslanders and Australians from choosing to access a whole range of services for vaccine preventable diseases, acute occasions of service and chronic disease management in those three important areas from their local community pharmacy. And they will pay and pay with pleasure to be able to not have to wait four hours in an ED or four days to see a GP. So just as we're funded by the federal government, Right? We're still regulated by state and territory governments. What medicines we can prescribe, what medicines we can dispense, what medicines we can administer, and what medicines we can review are largely controlled by Health, Drugs and Poisons Acts at state and territory governments. They're not controlled by appropriation bills for funding of the listing of new medicines by the Commonwealth. Right? And this is where our profession's focus has to be, on providing those solutions to those pressure points with state and territory governments. Now, there has not been a better example, a more prominent example over recent times of where pharmacy has provided a solution to a strained healthcare system than vaccinations. As I said before, only eight years since the first pharmacist put a needle into an Australian's arm, it was here in Queensland, it was, in, it was for influenza. Eight years later now, right, and we still can't administer an influenza vaccine for all people that are entitled to get it under the TGA listing. Right? Most of them are approved for four years of age and over. We still don't have access in all pharmacies in Queensland for NIP for the 65 years plus. Right? And yet, despite those restrictions, of which there is no good financial reason or clinical reason of why pharmacists can't give a flu vaccine to anybody that is required and approved to give it by the TGA, one in four vaccines in a nationwide for influenza have been given by a community pharmacist. From zero Eight years, ago, eight years ago to 24%, right, this calendar year to date. So when all other things remaining equal, Queenslanders and Australians choose time and time again to get the service from their local community pharmacist. Imagine if we either had an MBS item number 
or a PPA payment to be able to provide free influenzas for anyone that was entitled to it under the Therapeutic Goods Administration. Imagine what that number would be. Now, the other point that I want to point out in this graph is there's three different colours, right? Grey, the turquoisey colour, and then, of course, us at the bottom. The grey are mass vaccination hubs, which have all but been discommissioned, as they should, right? Because those nurses and other health professionals should go back to doing what they were doing before we had a pandemic. So I get a lot of questions about, Trent, what's the future of the 2023 influenza season? Is there going to be a universal um, influenza program like there was last year? Are they going to tell us ad hoc in June, or are they going to tell us up front what it's going to be like? That, I can assure you, all of the branch presidents and I have written to National Cabinet, and of course we have asked for an answer by the end of this month, because we know we have to place our orders with our generic suppliers for what our 2023 influenza wants to be. So we've asked for a nationally consistent program, albeit state-funded, the, the Victorian remuneration model, right, $23.50 plus GST, right? Um, we don't have to worry about what program you have, whether it's um, uh, going to be Guild Care or Med Advisor, because it'll all be one program uh, by the time we get to next year, right? So I know a few of you had a bit of grief about that. And, and, and on that, we're not always going to get the rollout of a new full scope of practice initiative right. I know a lot of you got a bit angry and I ignored a lot of the calls that I got because what I knew, right, is we were already rolling Project Stop into Guild Care. We'd already done the deal with an ASX listed company to roll Guild Care into MedAdvisor. But I can't talk to you about a lot of those things that we're doing behind the scenes. But I can assure you, right, Amanda and I and, and the rest of the National Council, we own pharmacies, we still work in our pharmacies, Amanda more so than me, right, but we know of the pressure points when a new program is rolled out. And all I can do, right, is I'm not gonna promise you we'll get it right every time, but I'll promise you that the next year we do it, we'll get it done a little bit more smoothly, right? So um, I hear that you're a little frustrated, especially if you're a Terry White Hemmart franchisee, right? I don't apologize for it at all, right? Because we had a free universal influenza program for the first time ever this year. And if the Queensland branch of the Guild hadn't said yes, to roll it out through Guild Corp backs, no other state would have followed. No other state would have followed, right? So, but we'll get it a lot easier for you next year. But the point is, is those vaccination hubs won't exist next year. So you need about 66, 67% vaccination rates to reach herd immunity, okay? So we're not going to maintain those ridiculously high yet wonderful vaccination rates for COVID-19 of 93, 94, 95%. That is not going to be achievable next year, okay? So when we start publicising, the media no doubt will be sensationalist about it and say vaccination rates have plummeted, right? But we've given people their freedom back, right? A lot of us think we shouldn't have taken off from the start with, but we've given people their freedom back. And so a normal vaccination rate to achieve herd immunity is in its high 60s. And that's the vaccination rate that we'll probably end up with for COVID-19 next year. And that is still a good vaccination rate. We need higher vaccination rates in at-risk populations, like people living in residential aged care facilities. But even though the vaccination rate for COVID-19 will be lower, they'll have less choices of where to get it from, right? Because those mass vaccination hubs won't exist. So if you think it's gonna be slower next year in pharmacy, it won't, right? Because even though the rates will be lower, there'll be less access points, but you'll still be one of them. Now, we're not resting on our laurels. I said to you before, Morrison had a budget in April. We've got Elbow got a budget next month. And these are the things that the Guild is still advocating on behalf of all of your patients for and all of your practices for and all of your practitioners for. It's ridiculous that the majority of the Royal Aged Care Commission recommendations have been for inpatient or residential aged care. I'm going to talk about some of the harebrained things that the Commonwealth are trying to do with aged care and pharmacy in a moment. But we have put a submission in for $1.3 billion, $1.3 billion over the forwards, and that's, a, that's an extraordinary amount of money in anybody's language. But it's, an ex, it's a very, very efficient model for pharmacy and pharmacists and pharmacy assistants to be able to help Australians to age where they want to age, and that's at home, right? The cheapest place for our economy, the cheapest way for our society to be able to allow people to age and age with dignity is to give them a little bit of help to stay at home and stay at home longer than it is to provide them a very expensive amount of help when we put them into a facility. We don't have aged care facilities in Australia, we have end of life facilities, right? The average length of stay in a RACF in Australia, depending on whether I'm using the mean, median or mode, is somewhere between six and 24 months. That's where people go to die, 
right? People age at home, right? They go into facility, unfortunately, for the very, very end when family members can't care for them. And that's what those facilities should be reserved for. Um, uh, community pharmacies vaccination. Now, it's great we've got a trial, a few trial sites in Queensland for access to the NIP, but we still don't have a paid remuneration system to be able to cover the out-of-pocket expenses to administer the vaccine. So there's still, as I said, an inequity for Queenslanders and Australians to be able to, sure, they can get the over 65 NIP from a Victorian pharmacy or they can get it from a Victorian general practice, but if they go to a Victorian general practice, there's no out-of-pocket, right? If they go to a Victorian community pharmacy, there's an out-of-pocket expense for the administration. So that's what that particular fee is for. Um, $201.5 million for workforce. Not a dollar of that is for a community pharmacy owner. Do you know that um, we, the, the Commonwealth taxpayer pays UQ, QUT, Griffith and JCU, right, per student per year, so these things are called CSPs or Commonwealth Supported Places. They pay those universities more money per student per year um, if they are studying nursing and they do pharmacy, if they're studying environmental science, if they're studying pharmacy, if they're studying paramedicine than if they're studying pharmacy. So let me tell you, universities, and I know, I've been, on a, I've been on the board of one for a very long time, they're big businesses. And vice chancellors are their chief executive officers. And if they have one product line that is delivering greater revenue to Central than another product line, that's where their attention is going to be, right? It is more profitable for a vice chancellor to deliver a paramedicine course or a nursing course or an environmental science course than it is to deliver a nursing one. So what happened here a few years ago is we had three bands of CSP funding, cheap, middle, expensive, right? Arts, medicine, right? And we were all in the middle. When they split it into four, there was an upper and middle band. Our profession didn't put a submission in on what band we should be in. No one did, right? And the Guild, as the peak body, takes responsibility for that. No one else did, but that's fine. It's our job to fix it. So the submission, and we've met with, and this is the Committee of Pharmacy Schools for Australia and New Zealand, or CPS, and the Guild have put a joint submission in to move us from the middle um, uh, lower to the middle upper band, okay? Because we need to invest. There's nothing better than a homegrown, home-trained pharmacist. I'll talk about skilled migration in a moment. The rest of those $201.5 million are for things like um, intern placement allowances, intern extension allowances to stay on as a first year registered pharmacist because there are some anomalies, and I can see Lucy here, of some programs being available to some modified Monash pharmacies but not over to other modified Monash pharmacies, right? So it's to make sure that there is money if you're a regional rural remote pharmacist to come to CPD. Um, there's, there's more money for pharmacy students to be able to go on regional rural remote placements. So it's all pouring money into the factory that creates our workforce, the universities, and of course, employee pharmacists and our future pharmacists as well. Um, $647 million, and that is to further reduce the co-payment. Listen, the big aim of your National Council, um, a few of the speakers said this is, this is my dream. Yes, it's my dream, but it's not, it's not my vision, it's your National Councillor's vision. We want to turn down price as a reason choose their, people choose their local pharmacy, and we want to turn up scope. So people choose their local community pharmacist because of the solutions that you provide, okay? Because of the ways in which you can help them stay out of hospitals, stay fit and healthy, stay productive members of society, not because you offer the dollar discount or because they got the full page, full colour ad out of the career mail, okay? So this is to further reduce the reduction from $42.50 to $30, from $42.50 down to $19. 19 is where it needs to be. 19 is what addresses the 1 million Australians that the Australian Bureau of Statistics said, right, delay, defer or go without getting their general medicines dispensed. The data clearly shows us. This isn't Guild data, ABS data. If you're one of those 9 million Australians with a healthcare concession, veteran affairs, pension card, self-funded retiree, you might be on less money, sure, but you're getting far more benefits. You do not have an affordability problem for medicines. If you have a household income of around $100,000 to $120,000, which is not that much for two income earners with a couple of kids paying a mortgage, you can't afford two or three $42.50 a month. You can't afford two or three $30 a month. It is the anomaly in the OECD, right, that we have a two-tiered system. If you go to France, if you go to Germany, if you go to the United Kingdom, gee, if you go to Wales and Ireland, it's free, right? We have some people that get it free, some people that pay $6.80, and some people pay up to $42.50. We're not advocating for $6.80 for everybody. We, we can't afford that. 
right? But we need to get that down to $19. At $19, the 1 million people that delay, defer, or go without reduces to zero. So 30 bucks is a good first step, but it doesn't statistically fix all of the people, the working poor, that can't afford access to essential medicines. $6.7 million for digital enablement. Now, I'm not throwing Paul under a bus here, but my favorite deputy secretary, I won't say her name, um, she, it drove me nuts when I was over in Woden in Canberra where she told me we've hit 10% digital prescriptions now. You must be so happy that your dispensaries are much more efficient and productive. <laughs> I mean, for, you know, um, I've got tokens, I've got ASLs, I've got that el electronic record for aged care facilities cause it still hasn't completely taken off, mate. I've got wet stuff out of somebody's handbag and my all-time favourite, handing over the mobile phone that they were probably doing Facebook on the dunny and I've got to scan it myself. <laughs> the amount of different avenues that a prescription can come into my dispensary now is continually multiplying and every time I change or add on a new variable, it compounds, it compounds the confusion that can happen in a dispensary, which ultimately doesn't just create inefficiencies, it can lead, it can lead to very real clinical errors, right? So this is more funds to not roll out digital prescriptions, but to help invest with companies like Fred, right? To help manage that workflow in the dispensary so we can streamline it and make it easier and rip out some of the confusion. Now, the last one, is, is the one I'm the most passionate about. And this is the fact that in Australia, um, we have an opioid pandemic. We're not talking about it because we've had another pandemic to talk about. Um, but most people in Australia that are addicted to opioids are addicted to licit opioids, not illicit ones, right? It is um, criminal, frankly, that it's, we spend taxpayer funds to get people hooked on $6.80 Oxycontin 80s one three times a day, but they have to pay 34 bucks at least out of pocket expense each week to go on a methadone or a suboxone or some form of opioid replacement therapy. In Canada, there's no national system, it's provincially based, but the data shows us in Canada, if there was one national PBS, the number one product on their pharmaceutical benefit scheme would be opioid replacement therapy, right? So the government commissioned a post-market review in 2019 before the pandemic and they've sat on it and not released it. They've sat on it and not released it because I'll bet you anything, right, it says that we have an opioid pandemic, A, that doing real-time medicine monitoring and making pharmacists police officers, right, without giving them the clinical appropriate referral pathways and appropriately funded program to get people off it has resulted in nothing but health inequality and they've sat on the report, right? So this is a huge area of underinvestment. One of my pharmacies does a lot in opioid replacement. It's a white collar crime, quite frankly, and it's an absolute failure of Australian public policy. I'm asked, how do you go with the new guys, Trent? Well, we go pretty good. So here's the sheriff, skulls a schooner, right? And um, he spent an awful lot of time overseas. He's saying all the right things, saying all the right things. Right? I've had dinner with him a couple of times, several lunches, and also that his office answers any call that we put in. Right? We text, we email, we've got a great relationship. And it's not just with the Prime Minister's office, it's with Richard Miles, the Deputy Prime Minister's office, it's with Jim Chalmers, Great Queenslander, the Treasurer's office. Right? It's with Katie Gallagher, the Senator from the ACT, who's the Finance Minister. Of course, it's with the Health Minister, Mark Butler, from South Australia. And of course, it's with our favourite uh, politician, Emma McBride, the Assistant Minister for Health, who also happens to be a pharmacist, smartest person in part Parliament. We have a great relationship with them because the Guild, the College and PDL have always done right, um, uh, the right thing when it comes to advocating and building relationships. There's no such thing as a, as a government and an opposition. There's a government and an alternative government, isn't there, Amanda? And so the first time these people had met that tie, that scarf, was not when they were elected after the 21st of May. The first time they became aware of issues that are concerning our patients that are concerning our practitioners and concerning our practices was not the 21st of May this year, right? It wasn't the year before, it wasn't the term before, right? The first meeting we had with all of these people was the day after the Rudd Gillard Rudd government lost their election, right? So we have a great relationship with them, but as I said to you before, rhetoric's cheap, right? It's not until they start saying how they're gonna spend your money do you actually see what their priorities are, so we're really looking forward to what their budget is next month.
So community pharmacy is the solution. The first couple of speakers mentioned that. When the Prime Minister called and said, Trent, can you do the rats through your Sudafed thing? I said, yes, and we figured it out later. Jeanette Young called me when I was the Queensland president and said, Trent, I need you to do um, point of care testing for COVID positive patients in pharmacies. I was like, oh, yes, doc, we can do that for you. Hung up, called all of you, and you're like, Trent, what are you doing? <laughs> right? And I hear you, right? But the point is, if the pharmacy profession wants to be seen as the go-to solution for problems in the healthcare sector, right? The first few problems they come with, you can't say, nah, not exactly my biggest priority, right? The answer, we have, two, we have two rules at National Council, don't we, Amanda? The first one is you only ever do media wearing a Ben Casey. If I see you doing it wearing a tie or a scarf, you're put on the back bench for a term and then I'll bring you back next term, right? And the white jackets are really good when we do media because that's what you want people to see. When they see the Guild, they want, you want them to see their local community pharmacist. You don't want them to see a whole heap of white blokes in suits. The second thing is if anyone from any level of government, whether it be the elected officials or the unelected officials, whether it be Queensland government or Commonwealth government, calls us with a problem, the answer will be yes, we can help you with that and we'll sort it out later. Right? So sometimes you might think, why did you agree to Jeanette Young's t um, request for doing testing for COVID-19 vaccine, uh, COVID-19, I don't, I don't want to do that, and that's fine. The great thing about full scope of practice is you don't have to do it, it's not mandatory. The great thing about full scope of practice is you don't have to do all of the things all of the time for all of the people. You can do some of the things some of the time for some of the people. It depends on what you're personally comfortable with and it depends on what's appropriate for your practice. Our job at the Guild is to provide the opportunities for you to provide those solutions to your patients, not to tell you which ones you do and don't do. So we've been able to provide solutions, right? Not just to point of care testing for the most poor, the most frail, the most old and the most vulnerable. We've been able to provide inoculations for very young, very old and very frail from working class people as well in a really cost effective and for government, I can assure you, it was the cheapest platform they had to deliver it. Um, but we've also been able to provide solutions for other things. I'm, I'm getting into full scope now. This is the path, all the different steps, the college, PDL and the Guild have to go through to bring a new service to market, to enable a member of the public to access a new service from your practice, from your practitioners. Not only do we have to establish the need, not only do we have to poll and find out um, whether or not there is public support, and we're very lucky to have Jared Bennett as our branch director. He's, he's a genius at this, and we got more polling in today, which was extremely heartening. Um, we have to find the legislative way to do it. Is it a change in an act of parliament? Is it a change in regulations? Is it a change in a, in a drug therapy protocol or an extended practice authority? And it's a complete mosaic across the country. It's different in every state or territory. Do we have the right training, the right professional practice standards, the right insurance? Can we prove right, to elected and unelected officials that we have the skills and knowledge necessary to perform that new task, right? And this is the checklist we have to go through before a new vaccine is added to a standard, before an age is added to a vaccine, or before urinary tract infections are able to come um, uh, uh, to, uh, before solutions to urinary tract infections are able to be provided uh, to Queenslanders. Now, which one did we do here? Uh, I did UTIs in every other state because they can't do it. Um, don't have to do UTIs here. Uh, well, Pharmacist Day is on the 25th of this month. And um, not only will you see um, a whole heap of Australian leaders line up um, and say thank you to all of the pharmacists and pharmacy assistants for what you're doing. Trust me, they've all lined up. Um, uh, there's one that hasn't given me their video yet, Cos, but I've named and shamed them and I'm going to have a cardboard cut out of them if they don't give me the video by Monday. But we're also releasing a report. Now, our National Cabinet, all of the First Ministers, Premiers, Chief Ministers, the Prime Minister, um, the, new, the new National Cabinet under Albanese, commissioned the Secretary of Prime Minister and Cabinet, Mr um, Glenn Davis, who was the Vice-Chancellor of, was it Monash or Melbourne? one of those two, um, who's now the secretary to do a review. Uh, which one was it? Griffith. He's with Griffith as well. So um, to do a review of Australia's healthcare system, not the Queensland healthcare system, not the Commonwealth healthcare system, the entire healthcare system. So the Guild has commissioned Ernst & Young to do the submission on behalf of the, of the profession, and we'll be launching this around World Pharmacist Day. 
And what it says basically is let us help. Let us help provide solutions to vaccine preventable diseases. Let us help provide solutions to acute occasions of service. Let us help manage chronic disease. And guess how much money we want for it? Not a cent. Because Australians, Queenslanders will pay and pay with pleasure, just as they've done with vaccines, just as they've done um, uh, with private rapid antigen tests, and just as they've done with urinary tract infection uh, pilot, to get a solution where they don't have to wait four hours in ED or four hours for a general practice appointment. And the savings, I'm not going to tell you what they are tonight, this is just a snapshot, the savings are in the billions. And not the single digit billions, but the double digit billions of dollars annually by reducing vaccine, uh, by reducing potentially preventable hospital presentations, by reducing ambulance ramping, and by making sure that people can get safe, effective service from a convenient, trusted source, which is their local community pharmacy. So watch for the media around that particular time. But listen, to be able to do this, we have to invest. Not just in our digital assets and our virtual environment, not just in our physical assets and our consulting rooms, but we have to invest in our people. We have to invest in our workforce. And this is, yes, our important student pharmacists, our important pharmacy assistants, and of course our pharmacists. Right? We have to change. Now, I can tell you, remember we had that review? I certainly remember it. I took over from Tim as state president, and within the first month, the Queensland government announced a parliamentary review into whether pharmacists should own pharmacies, and I thought, crikey, I've been president of Queensland for four weeks, so they want to deregulate. So it was, it was very, very scary. Um, but we got through that, and not only did the parliamentary committee um, put a recommendation to parliament where all 93 members of parliament, every single member of parliament, endorsed the provision of pharmacist owned pharmacies. Every member, right? Labor, LNP, all of the crossbench. But they also, all of them, endorsed pharmacists practicing to full scope of practice and doing more things like urinary tract infection prescribing and more vaccines and a whole raft of things. But one of the things they highlighted, and Aaron Harper, the state member for Tharangawa in Townsville, is a paramedic and his claim to fame before he became a parliamentarian and subsequently the chair of the Health Community Services and Domestic Violence Prevention Committee in Queensland Parliament. His claim to fame was he was a unionist for um, the paramedic union. And um, when Rudd Gillard Rudd established the, the ARPA framework and we went to national registration, the paramedic board wasn't one of those foundation boards. And through his advocacy and his colleagues' advocacy, the paramedicine board was established and they became nationally registered health professionals as well. But his focus was not on the pharmacist. He said, I love you people, I know you should do more. Talk to me about your assistance. So there were recommendations in that report, which still have not been actioned, but are coming, right? Which basically said, and I'll paraphrase the following, it is a reasonable expectation of a Queenslander that if they walk into any of your um, 1,100 pharmacies, right, that the pharmacy assistant that gives them advice on breast pumps, on wound care, on complementary medicines, has some form of training. Right? And only 24% of pharmacy assistants have a cert two or above. Only 24%. Right? 76% of pharmacy assistants have only have either no training or only done the S2, S3 module. Right? Now, I'm the only stupid person in my family that went to uni. The rest did trades and they're all earning a fortune. But all of the trades, my sister that's a hairdresser. Right? My brother that's a mechanic. My other brother's a mechanic. We've got an electrician. We've got a plumber. We've got everything. Right? I just need a cabinet maker. But they've all done a certificate three. All of those trades require a certificate three. Right? And there is no mandatory minimum training for pharmacy assistants in Queensland or indeed nationally. And guess what? That's going to change. And guess what? I support it. Right? Because it is a reasonable expectation by a member of a public that if they come into a pharmacy, that the person giving them advice has some form of qualification. Just like it's a reasonable expectation that if they go into a hairdresser, the person with a pair of scissors has some form of training, or they call an electrician to come home, they have some form of training. We are not meeting consumers' expectations, right? I just hope we have enough lead time to be able to implement the training. And of course, it would be great if the government put their money where their mouth is and there was no out-of-pocket expenses for the employer or the employee to be able to do the training as well. If I did a straw poll tonight, I have no doubt that 24% would not be reflective of the people in this room, because by the very nature that you're engaged and come to things like this, you're more proactive. But unfortunately, that is the statistics of the 65,000 of our paraprofessionals. This is the wheel 
Now, before Gillard was Prime Minister, she was the Education Training Minister. Um, what she did was bring together the vocational training sector with the higher education training sector, right? ASQA and TESQA, for those people who are familiar with it. This ten, these 10 slices on the wheel behind me represent all forms of education in Australia. Level one, two, three, four, certificate, one, two, three, four. Level 10 is a PhD, level nine is a master's, level eight is a graduate diploma, level seven is a bachelor. We have to turn that wheel, right? for not just our pharmacy assistants, right, but also pharmacists. So you'll see a lot of talk, and the pharmacy students are all too aware of this. If somebody who has, according to this framework, which has been in place now for over a decade, if you've done five years of tertiary education, that volume of work is equivalent to a master's degree, right? Unfortunately, a four-year B-Farm or B-Farm ONS plus a one-year internship does not classify as that on this wheel. So a misnomer by a lot of pharmacist employees in Australia is that the Guild should just go and sit down with the unions, do a deal, put a submission into the Fair Work Commission, we'll get it stamped and we'll all get a pay rise. We could do that and the Fair Work Commission will reject it because we have to benchmark wages in the awards. There has to be a relativity component to other professions or other vocational trades that help us benchmark what the pay rate is. I want higher wages because lower wages are not a profession I want to be in, right? I want a better paid, better remunerated, better skilled workforce because a lower paid, lower skilled, lower remunerated workforce is not something that's going to attract capital if you're an owner and it's not something that's going to attract talent if you're an employee either and we need both of those things to be able to do all of the stuff that we need to do. Right? So we are going to have to invest in both our student pharmacists and our pharmacy assistants. Now, all of this stuff is wonderful, but I can't get staff in stock today, like right now. Right? And one of the problems we have with stock is like many things in this country, we don't make things anymore. Right? 90%, 9 of the Australian um, medicines, and Cos can tell you this, are imported. We only make about 10% of the volume in Australia now. So we either need to load up new factories and start making things, but the only way you can compete with overseas factories is if you have cheap energy, nuclear, coal, right, or low wages. And those two are two things that are not compatible uh, with Australian values. So we're still going to rely very heavily. I think 90-10 is still too skewed. There should be a bit more balance there, no doubt. But we're still going to be relying very heavily on imports for medication security in Australia. What the Commonwealth Government has done is said that we need a national medicine stockpile. This doesn't mean that Albo has a big storage shed under Burley Griffin and he's filling it full of drugs. What he's done is he's teamed up with the importers, the drug manufacturers, and said by the 1st of July next year, you have to have six months worth of buffer, right, of your PBS stock on shore at all times, right? So guess what? These drug shortages, these drug outages are going to be here till at least July next year because they have to start hoarding right, and get that supply up from eight weeks worth of stock on average, okay, to six months worth of stock. So there's stock there they could give us, but they're starting to build those reserves. And if they don't build those reserves, they're going to get a show cause notice. If they don't have a good show cause, then they'll get delisted. So that's building. We're going to continue to have drug shortages, though, for the remainder of, of uh, well, for all of this financial year, unfortunately, and end until next Listen, the last parliament, as I said to you before, had over 2,000 new or amended listings, right? And that was funded by cost, cut costs to low cost, high volume drugs. Now, if you're a drug manufacturer overseas, and it doesn't matter if you're in Bangladesh or Berlin, it doesn't matter where you are, um, you too have ebbs and flows in your input costs. And that could be human talent as well. They've got, drug, they've got staff shortages like us, or it could be raw materials. It could be raw materials for the the API, the active pharmaceutical ingredient, or it could be the caps or the bottle or the jar or the ampule or whatever it is. Um, if they're no longer making as much money out of the Australian market, which is roughly the size of that of California, they will deprioritize, right? They will deprioritize supplying the Australian market. And that's exactly what's happened. Price disclosure hasn't only just affected the amount of investment in chronic disease management domestically, it's also adversely impacted the supply of medicines that treat chronic disease management. This is workforce data and the shortage of pharmacists that we're going to have moving forward. I have no idea how they think we have a surplus of 48 pharmacists last year because 
I'll take all of them just for cans, <laughs> okay? Um, but, but what I do take away from this is there's going to be at least 500 pharmacists short each and every year for the, for the foreseeable future, and that compounds. So we're going to have thousands of pharmacists short by the end of the forwards, and some of them will come back from those vaccination hubs as they decommission, sure. But we have a massive, massive um, workforce problem. Now, listen, we're not special, and we're certainly not unique, right? We can't get butchers, bakers, or candlestick makers in Australia at the moment. We can't get anything. We can't get anybody. Now, one of the grand bargains at the Jobs and Skills Summit the week before last was they're going to increase skilled migration, right? Remember, we've had zero for two and a half years, up to 195,000. Just so you know, all of the premiers have already said they're taking all of those skilled migrants for their own state workforces. So there's none for you or me, right? So we need more than 195,000 to be able to not just staff the ballooning bureaucracies and hospitals that are the state and territory governments, right? But we need more to be able to staff primary care. And this isn't just pharmacy, right? This is the medical profession, the nursing profession. This is the aged care profession. I'm going to talk a bit about, more about aged care in a moment. This is everybody, right? So the Guild, I can assure you, is pulling every lever that is available to us. More money for universities, trying to return the prestige to the profession through full scope of practice, the doctor of pharmacy title, investing more money in pharmacy students, investing more money in regional pharmacy maintenance um, allowances and workforce um, placements and CPD, but also it needs to be an importing um, more skilled migrants as well, but that is going to be a very slow burn and we're competing for a finite amount of places in a really, really tight employment market. I'm going to get a bit angry on this one because, quite frankly, there are a few lies around that I just need to address. Um, the funds on the screen behind me, right, the $346 million, there's a few people peddling the fact that this is new money to be able to fund pharmacists in aged care facilities, and that's a flat-out lie. Lie, right? The money in the community pharmacy agreement, the last one, the six, was $1.263 billion to fund all professional programs, RMMRs, HMRs, meds checks, diabetes meds checks, um, dose administration aids, the regional pharmacy maintenance allowance, all of the other workforce programs. The funding budget for this agreement, $1.2 billion. Now, we always spend more money in the fifth year of agreement than we do in a first, right, because of not just inflation, in price per occasion of service, but also in the number of occasion of service given in each of those areas, right? The difference, if we had just continued every program in the last agreement, BAU, right, no increase, no modified Monash regional pharmacy maintenance allowance instead of rural pharmacy maintenance allowance, no full funded indigenous dose administration aids, no new things, right, we would have hit 1.263 billion plus $346 million. So this new, new funds that they're giving us, they've taken out of those other programs. And the government is yet to make a decision on what they're cutting out of community pharmacy programs to fund that. Are they going to discontinue RMMRs? Are they going to discontinue HMRs? Are they going to halve the dose administration aid budget? Are they going to get rid of Indigenous DAAs? Get, get rid of the regional, regional pharmacy maintenance allowance? I don't know. I'm not helping them decide what to cut. Right? So. Um, you don't have to be um, a, an economist to be able to realise here that something doesn't smell quite right. So the reason there's been extensions, the reason it probably won't go live on the 1st of January is because the government, right, and in their defence they inherited this. It wasn't their decision, they've inherited it. But the Guild's put the submission in, it's due tomorrow. If any of you have had time to put a submission in, thank you very much. Um, but I said to Mr Albanese when I had dinner with him the week before last, thank you for putting nurses in nursing homes. But why are you taking pharmacists out of pharmacies to fund a new program where there is no workforce? And he said, Trent, we're not going to take pharmacists out of pharmacies. I said, well, you better tell your health department that. And he said, I will. Right? So I want pharmacists to be everywhere medicines are. I don't have a problem with pharmacists being able to bill PPA individually. I don't care. I don't, I don't mind that at all. Right? But when there's not enough Vegemite to spread over the number of sandwiches you've promised people, right, you either need to take a few pieces of bread off people or you need to give them a larger jar of Vegemite. And that's his problem, right? That's not mine. Second last slide, and then we're going to take some questions. Again, thank you to PDL and thank you to the college. Most importantly, thank you to Gold Cross because there's a bag of jelly beans in every seat. This is Oprah. Everyone gets a prize. 
but I just want to finish where I started and genuinely I just want to say thank you to all of you. Thank you for trusting the Guild and the College and PDL through um, what was a really rocky time when we were literally building the ship while we were trying to fly it across a rapid antigen test program and ever-changing vaccination space with policy by press conference and moving a target advice and a whole raft of things. Um, I can't promise you the next 24 months is going to be slower and calmer than the last 24. All I can promise you is that um, the three organisations and every woman uh, we employ will get up every day and put our boots on and go in and advocate for you and your patients. So thanks very much for coming. Appreciate it. Thanks, Trent, and I think I can speak for everyone when I say that um, we pretty much hung on every word that he was saying there. Um, we've got a couple of uh, microphones roaming around, um, so get your questions ready. Um, but, you know, I've got a microphone here, so I'm going to take advantage and kick off first. Um, we, we are in Queensland, so I am going to do a Queensland-based uh, question first, and this one is for Trent. So. Um, scope of practice, it's, it's pretty darn exciting and hopefully we'll get an announcement fairly soon about when, when that can all start. But um, when I'm talking to members, one thing I hear about is scope, that's great, um, I really want to do it, but we are having trouble getting pharmacists. So yep. it's, it's a chicken or egg thing. Yep. Um, and so how do, you, um, how do we work with that? Sure. So um, this... None of these things will happen in a linear fashion. A lot of these things will happen in parallel. As I said, we're pulling every lever we can to have a comprehensive workforce solution to ensure that not only all of your practices have um, the very best talent in the pharmacist and pharmacy assistant space to provide the very best practices and the very best services to, to all of your communities, but, um, and you know, they will come uh, from domestic trained um, uh, people and they'll come for, from skilled migrants as well. But listen, um, Scope, right? Um, I'll, I'll briefly um, explain it to, to, to all of you. So it basically means being able to do all things with medicines. I said before, you can do four things with medicines. You can prescribe them, dispense them, administer them, and then review them. Now, you're not a specialist if you can prescribe. You're not a specialist if you can review. You're a specialist if you can provide a solution to somebody's problems. And you need to be able to do all four of those things right, to provide solutions to vaccine preventable diseases, to provide solutions to acute occasions of service, whether it be a urinary tract infection, whether it be exercise induced asthma, whether it be the oral contraceptive, whether it be dermatitis, right, how good would it be to be able to give alufrat instead of a 1% hydrocortisone, something that works? How good would it be to be able to give a long acting beta instead of a short or a combination puffer? Um, chronic disease management, how good would it be to be able to help someone manage their, their asthma or manage their hypertension or manage um, their, their diabetes by, by titrating doses and, and initiating therapy? But listen, there are 35,000 pharmacists in Australia, right? So there are 35,000 scopes of practice, okay? Our job is to advocate and get the barriers removed, to educate, to make sure that you're competent to be able to do it and to be able to ensure you to provide the safe environment to be able to deliver those services. Does anyone know the average size of a GP's pharmacopoeia? How many drugs they know? Debbie's here, she should know. 50, exactly. The average GP knows half your fast lane, right? And being able to participate in the full scope of practice trial when it happens, and it'll start in regional Queensland, but it will go everywhere because it will be a success. You will have to do more training. Right? We will have to make sure your insurance is upgraded. Right? Um, you will, and the, the extra training will probably be 12 months, a grad cert, that you'll do part-time while, while you're working. But you don't have to look after all of those people all of the time. Right? The delivery of the occasions of service will be, I know this, a J-curve. We'll start, and the reason it'll be a J-curve is because you will have to build confidence as you can do it. The public will have to become aware that you can do these new things. You will have to recall patients to look after them and they'll come back for repeat visits. But you'll start slowly. You'll start slowly by giving someone a serotide who's overusing their Ventolin. 
You'll start slowly by giving alufret to someone that's overusing their hydrocortisone. You'll start slowly, right, by maybe putting somebody on um, a combination um, uh, therapy for their dyslipidemia instead of being on a single one and they're getting cramping. You'll start slowly by initiating a beta blocker and then maybe adding in a diuretic or an angiotensin. You will start slowly and build with confidence. But the really great thing is you don't have to do all of them all of the time. You might just say, I'm going to um, uh, help somebody with their, with their contraception, right? And I'm going to say, listen, you know what? You're coming in every five weeks for your pill. You should be every four. Why don't you go on the depot, you know? So our job, as I said, is to provide you the opportunities, the training, and the safety net. It's your job to choose which part of it you want to do. So participating in it, don't be daunted, right? It's as big as you want it to be, and it can be as small as you want it to be as well. Yeah. I, think, I think I had Amanda that Trent talked about the importance of the pharmacy assistant, and in, in people in hospital here, you know the pharmacy assistants are able to help you a lot more. There's no doubt that you know, with the right skills, the pharmacy assistants are going to be needed if you're going to do more. Yep. Uh, there's a lot of things you do today that you don't need to do. Uh, other people could do if they were uh, properly skilled and accredited. So I think you know, 65,000 workforce, um, it's not just the professional service you're going to have to do in full scope. You're going to have to document a lot. You're going to have to share that documentation with other professions. And you, know, you can't do that. You know, the doctor doesn't do that. We know what happens in the the surgeries today, they have assistance to help them. So that's the other part of the workforce solution. That's right. And if we can do it without, an, without another alt tab, that'd be great <laughs> as well. Um, and I think for those who get a bit scared by it, just think about how many times you write something down on a piece of paper and say, go ask the doctor for this. We can do it. We've got the skills already. A Titus meter, a Titus externa. You know, yeah. they're, they're not so complicated much. things. Yeah. So for you, Michelle, so we've... Oh. Um, our, our teams, we've, we've got a lot to do every day um, and it's, it's hard to fit yeah. everything into the day that we need to do. So how is the college going to, to help pharmacists and assistants um, find the time to take on these new services and prepare their workplaces to do that? Yeah, okay, good question. Um, through education and training, <laughs> prior to that though, well, no, part of that, there's so much that we have always done in pharmacy and that we do that no longer serves us or our customers to be quite honest. We've just carried on from decade to decade because pharmacy has always done this or pharmacy has always kept this product or kept this category. And I find this in pharmacy a lot when they ask for advice. I, I want to start a uh, pharmacy program, but I haven't got the room. So this is where the training and the education, uh, especially in the management and leadership and change management really helps. So by assessing your business, what is no longer delivering the gross profit from a category perspective, freeing up space that way to be able to put in new services, but also just, just letting go, letting go of, um, even looking at your dispensary branch, you know, the, the clutter on there, how can I streamline this to, uh, because we're all so busy and our minds are just cluttered, how can we make our area uh, less cluttered, which reduces risk, obviously? Um, do we really need that stand? Do we really need this? Because all that takes effort. Mm. And it may not seem like a lot, but all these things, the ordering, the unpacking the stock. Um, so, you know, from a stock perspective, specifically in a category perspective, that's all time to run. It's all costs money, resources, staffing. Um, and if, it, if it's fine in your businesses, that's great. But do the analysis and the education and training, we have that. And then how do you lead that team? You know, oh, we want to get rid of this category and then yep. dealing with the pushback. And there will be. Um, how do we deal with that? So this is where leadership and management and business skills are really important because there is so much more capacity when you free yourself up. And then obviously um, pharmacy assistants and empowering them to do that making sure that we have dispensary assistance behind every computer in the dispensary so again the pharmacist is freed up to do all the other things rather than talking to the customer, doing a vaccine, getting stressed because I know there's a script I need to dispense, but if it's still going because you have your dispensary assistance, we check, we check the history, all that. So there's so much avenue to provide capacity and education and yeah. training really helps with that. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, I love that the president of our college is, has been there, done that, and knows how to get it done. So we're very lucky to have Michelle. Um, do we have any questions from the audience yet? 
Can you raise your hands if you've got one? Uh, yep. Right here. Sophie's down here. So if you can just say your name and where you're from as well. Uh, my name's Sophie. I'm from Cooper Discount Pharmacy. Um, I had a query about the aged care $1.3 billion thing that you talked about at the very beginning, uh, keeping people at home with their dignity, et cetera, et cetera. But what does that program involve for us? Sure. So it's, um, I'll give it to you. So uh, email, <laughs> email Amanda and, and we'll send it through to you. Um, uh, but it's uh, not any more medication adherence services, so dose administration aids for people over the age of 75 specifically, and full paid ones like the Indigenous Dose Administration Aid. It's also home visits, right? So uh, more HMRs more frequently, okay? Um, and it's also visits by the pharmacy assistant as well, because just having somebody checked on, right? Um, uh, um, is, is so important. So it's basically getting the pharmacy out of the four walls of the pharmacy and into somebody's home. So it's adherence services um, and it's review services. Can I ask a second question? Yeah. How are we going with the um, same job, same pay with regard to vaccinations? Um, slow uh, is the honest answer. Um, and um, honestly, I don't think we'll see um, any movement, if any, on that until next calendar year anyway. So, um, because there's currently a, a review of that whole program and it won't be handed down before next month's budget. Go, Liz. Thank you. Someone gave me a mic. Um, just a quick question, Trent. I loved how you told us a little bit about flu because we're starting to think about flu, but I can't help but think a lot of my work this year was COVID vaccines. Hmm. What are we forecasting for next year? Are we going to be last minute hearing something and having to change our step? Will it be in line with our flu? What are we thinking there? What have we learned from last year that we can do differently Wouldn't that be Nirvana, hey? <laughs> um, so listen, I mean, all we know at the moment is firstly, Atagi has given no advice, right, to, um, uh, to the health officers um, on this yet. So, but the thinking in Canberra is that there will be at least an annual inoculation next year. So we're not gonna have this every three months anymore. So we won't be having, have you had your first, your second, your third or your fourth? It will be just like influenza. Have you had your 2022? Have you had your 2023? So that's the thinking. But again, as we move from pandemic to endemic, as China starts opening, as India starts opening, um, there could be another variant, right? Um, so the honest answer to that, Lucy, is there's a lot of water to go under the bridge. The whole world still isn't opened up yet, and there could be some new variant that... Um, and unfortunately, what we've seen is we go from Delta to Omicron. They've become um, uh, less severe but more contagious. Um, let's just hope that trend continues and it becomes less and less severe each time. But again, that's an unknown as well. Mr Logan? Thank you, Amanda. Tim Logan from Nambour and um, X some other jobs around the place. Um, <laughs> could any of the panel um, confirm my impression that at the moment consumers can't see what we see on the ASL in respect of um, repeats that are available and so forth? Uh, so is that the case and is there a plan to allow consumers to see that so they can be more confident in saying, right, I've got e-scripts, I'll go to the pharmacy and ask for them. Um, so, yeah, could anyone help me with that uh, particular query? <laughs> no one's for Paul, Or do you just want to well, look at each other uncomfortably? PDL would think... Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, it's a, it's a good question. The, the, the plan, there is a plan. It's always a plan. Uh, version, three of, <laughs> version three of e-scripts is due uh, this year, and that year's slipping away. That, that enables apps like Metavisor and hundreds of others at the moment that are all lined up to be able to show the ASL. Today, the only way you can do it is through WhatsApp. And again, it's a relatively small uptake at the moment. But if your patients are using WhatsApp, they can see their ASL. But every other app uh, is, is aren't waiting for it. That was a pilot. And uh, so all the other apps will probably be made in the year or next year. Are the instructions for that anywhere? Yeah, let's go to a, a web page of some IT company that <laughs> You're going to search for it. Um, Suzanne and I have a periodic hookup with the Australian Digital Health Agency, right? And there's a certain GP from Brisbane that, that's the head of it, so Steve. Um, and um, 
whilst I said before 10% of prescriptions in Australia are electronic, if you go to the United Kingdom, it's 90, right? So um, uh, what the government wants to have a conversation with us about is uh, the decommissioning of paper prescriptions. So, um, uh, you know, and, and that's something to be frank, if you ask for a time frame, I'd say the end of the next agreement, right? So 2030, which sounds like a, lot, a long time to Flynn, uh, but it's not to the rest of us, right? It'll be here before we know it. But um, you're not gonna get efficiencies in either the practice for the practitioner or most importantly for the patient um, uh, with all of these new things until we start decommissioning legacy assets. And that's a scary thing for a lot of us to think about that there will no longer be that tangible script, but it's, it's gonna come. I think there might be a couple of steps to that. Yeah. And obviously, if you put together the high risk uh, narcotic issue and the forgeries in narcotics, in most other overseas jurisdictions, narcotics are the first to be mandated electronic. Yep. Um, so that's probably a sensible way to go. And as soon as you do that, obviously the thing that happens is that every GP has to be able to do that if they want to uh, do high risk medicines. So that fixes that. But at the moment, you know, we've got 44,000 GPs using electronic scripts, but it's mainly the specialists uh, because of one of the software mm. vendors that's led, letting it down. So, mm. yep. But, you know, I've been on that journey for 12 years. Another, how many more is that? Do I have to keep going for another? Eight. Eight more, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, golly. We've got a question down the back. Thank you. Uh, Tim Fitzpatrick from Landsborough Chemist. One of the issues that I have with the, with the electronic prescriptions happened, yeah. is <laughs> a patient presents with their phone. They've got the blue writing that says they've got a prescription. They click on it. It gets scanned. It doesn't work. I'm sorry, you've, that's been dispensed. Yep. They accumulate all of these things on their phones yep. and they have no idea what's a current prescription and what's not. Correct. And um, I'm 65, just recently turned 65. I find it easier for them to hand me a piece of paper than it is within the amount of time that I've just done that motion. Than it is to scroll through, stand there, wait for them to scroll through numerous, numerous, numerous iterations and clog up my pharmacy and waste valuable time that we're all trying I, to save. I, I, think, I think we all agree that version one of these scripts isn't the solution. It was done during a pandemic for a reason. And so I, I don't disagree, but remember, if you sign that person up to ASL, you'll see their scripts. Now, they can't see them today, but you can, so I encourage you to do that for those people that can't manage it. Um, but if you, ultimately, at the moment, if you can't manage it, put them back to paper. That's, that's what the option's there for you while we work that back, so. Put them back to paper? What a novel idea. <laughs> but I do that, and I've got an authority prescription where it's come from some other pay, some of the, Someone's put it to paper. I've got half the information on a piece of paper that was there on a prescription before. Drives me insane. Yep. <laughs> I think that... Um, There's no that question there, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> there was no answer. I, th <laughs> I think we know what Paul will do if he got that 8.7 million wrapped up in a little bow uh, from, the, from yeah, our budget request. Money would be sorted. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yep. How about we catch up afterwards? Because uh, I'm not here for Fred tonight, so I'm happy to talk to you about that until I'm blue in the face, actually. So happy to do Hi. that. Oh, Hi. Hi. Um, my name's Emma. I'm a fourth year student at Griffith and sit as an executive director of NAPTA, so the National Association of Pharmacy Students. Um, just kind of going with this full scope of practice idea, very excited for it. How's that going to then work with embedding that into university degrees or is this, all of this going to be postgraduate study and then is this going to be pushing out a B farm or a BM farm combo sort of a degree out to a five, six, seven year degree to kind of cover all of this before you even 
finish yeah. that and then go into the industry as a good, pharmacist? Good question, Emma. Guess what? You're in great company because you, like the rest of us, will um, have to go and do a grad cert if we want to do it. <laughs> so it's 12 months extra for me, and it's 12 months extra for you. But the um, other part of your question is best answered by telling you what they're doing overseas. Right? So full scope of practice pharmacists in the United Kingdom and in Canada have been around for a very long time, over a decade, in fact. And what the authorities in, if I tell you, in Wales and in England uh, and um, in Alberta have decided over the past, some of them commencing next year, others commencing the year before COVID, was all new graduates will graduate with the ability to do all these new things. So. What they've decided to do is to embed full scope in the base registrable qualification, okay? So the rest of us have to be retrofitted um, and all the university programs, right, will be changed to be able to do it. How long is the period of time? It'll still be five years, right? It takes five years to train a pharmacist in Australia at the moment. Now, I know some universities have trimesters and some have B farms and M farms and there's a whole machination of things that that can happen in, right? And none of them are right or wrong. But basically, it takes five years to take somebody with a high school certificate and put them before the pharmacy board for registration. What I think will cease to exist is the intern year, right? Um, that body of experiential placement. Now, um, I've had a lot of conversations with universities about making sure that the experiential experience they give is reflective of real life, right? Because I don't believe the current placement structure of universities does. In the defence of the professors when you talk to them, currently their role is not to produce somebody that is ready for registration by the pharmacy board. That's not their job. If we make it their job, then they will do what the medical degree does and the nursing degree does and the physiotherapy degree and the dental degree and they will change the volume of, of experiential placement over the course of those five years. So um, it's not gonna be seven or six years, it will still be five years. Um, but you're just like the rest of us, Emma, you'll have to go into another 12 months to upgrade your degree. And then I think the big question is, will the professor be happy to be called a doctor once he's done his? Oh, I don't know. I think, um, <laughs> you know, the current vice president um, <laughs> doesn't have either of them. He's doing an all right job. Touche. I think that's a good point to finish off on. Um, thank you. Every oh, no, we've got one more question. Sorry, down the back. Yep. Trent, it's Owen from Sunshine Coast in Ireland. Mate, yep. I think the good king was visiting your people in Northern Ireland yesterday, wasn't he? Your, your people. <laughs> Just on the scope of skilled migrants, I'm one of these unusual people in this room who has come from 10 years journey to owning a couple of pharmacies in this beautiful state. Yep. 37 out of 38 we are, Trent. Mm. Pretty embarrassing. Mm. Do we have solutions? One of my suggestions is that we do come together, whether it's Queensland or nationwide, and we go and we steal graduates from England and Ireland, and I, for one, would be well up for that. <laughs> You're a good man, mate. Great crack. Listen, I totally agree. Um, uh, we're doing it in Queensland, um, and as is always the Queensland way, and this is being recorded, and the national president will show his bias, the rest of the country will follow our lead, right? Just as we did vaccines and they all followed, we're doing full scope in regional Queensland, um, and that will come to the southeast, and that will come to every other state and territory. Um, the Premier of New South Wales' office asked us about it two weeks ago when we were at Pharmacy Connect, and, they, um, and we've given them a briefing on what that could look like in New South Wales. The Health Minister in Victoria asked us about it last week when, um, when we met with her at the forum, and, and uh, we are briefing her department. The Chief Minister of the, uh, of the Northern Territory asked us about it yesterday when we met with her. Every state and territory has the same problems, right? Um, and every state and territory wants full scope of practice pharmacists. So it will start here, um, Owen, and it will spread to every other state and territory in the Federation, I have absolutely no doubt. The, the problem we've got, mate, is um, the rest of the developed world um, evolved, and we've just been a little slow to the party, but um, we were one of the last um, of these jurisdictions to vaccinate, um, and the World Pharmacy Council's data on the number of vaccines given last calendar year in 2021 we went from um, down the bottom of the pack, the bottom quintile, to the top quintile um, in 36 months. And so I think the exact same thing will happen with full scope of practice when it hits. Great. Exciting times ahead. Um, I will conclude the um, 
proceedings for tonight now. Uh, thank you very much for turning up tonight after long days on your feet. We really do appreciate it. Um, I think we'll be a few of us in the scarves. We'll stick around for a little while longer if you want to have a chat. But thank you, everyone, and good night. Safe travels home. <laughs>